You're listening to the best of the bravest. Interviews with the FDNY's elite. Waited a long time for this one, and finally tonight it comes to fruition. Welcome, ladies and gentlemen, to episode 243 of the Mike the New Haven podcast. This is the best of the bravest interviews with the FDNY's elite, volume 35, with my next guest who I'll introduce in a moment. What I will say, this is the final show of the year of 2022, and what a year it's been for our show before I embark on a lengthy hiatus. I'll get to that a little bit later at the end of the show. Previous episode was episode 242, the E-Men inside the NYPD's Emergency Service Unit with Ken Schnetzler. Ken was not only in the Emergency Service Unit of the NYPD, that was volume 30 of the miniseries, he worked in Truck 10. He was also previously in the New York City Transit Police in their Emergency Medical Rescue Unit. So interesting to chronicle Ken. And it'll be interesting to chronicle my next guest tonight for volume 35 of the best of the bravest. He served for 42 years with the New York City Fire Department. He joined the bravest in 1957 and he's worked his way through the ranks to attain the position of being a deputy chief, not just anywhere, but in Division three in the heart of Manhattan before retiring out of said division in the year 1999. And even in interim retirement, he's remained very active within the fire service. He writes a ton. He's currently writing, of course, on his uh, website, which you can check out. And I've linked in the description of this video, centered, of course, on proper firefighting tactics, amongst many other things. He's authored nine books. And that for this volume 35 of the best, of the bravest interviews with the FDNY's elite. I've been waiting a long time to say this. Retired FDNY Deputy Chief Vincent Dunn. Chief, welcome. How are you? Good. How are you doing, Mike? It's Ready good to, to go. have you. Yeah, ready to go as well. Looking forward to this. Like I said, it's yeah. been a long time coming to get you on. So, Chief, before yeah. we get into everything from the Navy yes. to the FDNY, tell yes. me where you grew up. I grew up in Sunnyside, uh, uh, 44th Street, uh, 51st Avenue, uh, Sunnyside. Went to St. Teresa's Grammar School, which was on 44th Street, same block. Uh so, so basically, that was it. So uh, I, I, that's where I started my initial childhood. You know, then we moved to Skillman Avenue. Uh, you know, that was on the other side of Queens Boulevard. So it was, uh, it was an Irish Catholic community. Of course, we lived in the same school as a Catholic school. Uh, so, so that was it. And I was not a good student. My sister, my sister was, but I had no interest in school. And uh, as I grew up, I, and in fact, you know, I had such little interest that I got kicked out of the seventh grade, St. Teresa's and in Sunnyside and went to, I uh, was transferred to uh, uh, Greenpoint, Brooklyn, St. Anthony's, you know, so I did the seventh grade and the eighth grade in uh, St. Anthony's. Yeah. So I went, I went from the nuns to the brothers. So I did a little brother better with the brothers because no nonsense with those guys. So, uh, so that was it. Uh, St. Anthony's. I I went over there recently and loved the, the neighborhood. Nice neighborhood. But I was a uh, day I graduated from St. Anthony's. Again, no interest in school. Not a good student. And uh, I went to Queens Vocational. And you know, back in Sunnyside, it was in Queens, right off Queens Boulevard there. At the time, and again, I, I didn't really apply myself. It was a good school, vocational school, and I could have learned a trade, which I later regretted, but I, I didn't. You know, you, you know, teenage life is a, is a is a desert disaster. It is a teen late. Mine was a teenage wasteland. So, uh, uh, so that was it. So, as soon as I could, uh, I were actually I worked. I quit school at 16 and I got a job at Orbach's department store. At the time that was in 14th street. And I was in the shoe department. I was, just, I stocked shoes, brought in new shoes, put them in the file cabinets so the salespeople could, could find them. And I marked the uh, size of the shoes. I did that for about a year and a half. And then uh, <clears throat> uh, three of us said, let's get out of here. Let's join the Navy. You know, the Korean War was started. You know, we had the Army or the Navy and three guys in the community said, let's, let's go to the Navy. So three of us went down to join, we were 17. We got in on a minority, they called it a minority cruise. Uh, you know, if, if you're under 18, if you're 17, you go in and you, you're discharged the day before you're 21 years old. 
So I have, I was 17 and a half when I went in and I was discharged the day before I turned 21. So that was good. I mean, the Navy was what I, I really needed. It provided some structure for me, you know, no nonsense. I lived on my own now I'm in the Naval base. I went to Bainbridge, Maryland for tra basic training. And uh, uh, then I got assigned to a cargo ship. I was assigned to the USS Lyoba, uh AF-36. It was a refrigeration cargo ship. And we did the Caribbean and the North Atlantic up Newfoundland. So it was the North Atlantic uh, going up to Newfoundland and the Caribbean out of Puerto Rico and Bermuda. We brought supplies, refrigerated supplies for the naval bases, you know, from Norfolk. When we, our, base, our home base was Norfolk, Virginia. Well, that was an experience on this uh, cargo ship. I was a, in, in the engine room, you know, I was like a wiper, you know, I did hand people tools and clean the diesel fuel. So uh, I did that for about a year, maybe a year and a half. And then I got transferred off the ship to a Guantanamo Naval Base, which was unbelievably beautiful. You know, nobody likes uh, Guantanamo, but I was assigned shore duty there. And uh, it was just like a paradise. The water was blue. You know, we had uh, barracks, which had jealousy windows that wind blew in. And it was good, good, not too hot, not too cold. And when it rained, it didn't rain for long. It was really a beautiful, Cuba is a beautiful island. So I, I worked at many very interesting jobs. Uh, they put me on the, as a, a hover patrolman first, you know, like a patrolman, basic MP. And I wasn't good at that. I didn't want like giving out tickets. <laughs> they wanted you to stop people uh, driving wildly, give out tickets. I did that. Then, uh, I worked in a boat crew, you know, they had uh, Leeward Island, you know, so you went from Guantanamo. There was an airfield over in Leeward Island. That's where they're holding those uh, 911 prisoners now. It's an isolated island close to Guantanamo. But at the time I was there, it was a uh, pilot uh, training for, for aircraft pilots, you know, they, and they would take off and land, and sometimes they just they crashed into the sea. But Leeward Island was where I ran the boats between the Guantanamo base, the naval base, and the air base up there. And then I got another another great assignment. It was uh, uh, to drive a spray truck. You know, and they didn't know, they weren't aware of the hazards of DDT, and. So we had a spray truck on the base. Mosquitoes were a big deal. So uh, uh, I was assigned with three other guys to spray the base. We would, they so they taught us how to drive a two and a half ton truck. You know, uh, they loaded it up with a tank of DDT and diesel fuel and a machine that would spray it into a fog pattern. And we would start spraying at 12 o'clock, start at one end of the base and go to the other end. And we would spray all the officers' uh, quarters and the enlisted men's barracks and uh, every place on the island. We had a path of roads to follow. So we would uh, spray everything. And it was mosquito control, actually. So, uh, but, but that was it. So I worked from midnight, I got off at eight. And, uh, and, and that was, then again, you were only allowed to do that for a year because they they understood the danger of DDT. They didn't want you to do it for five years. So I did that for a year. And uh, then at that time, near the end of my assignment there, it was uh, 1955, uh, Castro's army was up in the mountains there. We were in uh, Eastern Cuba. At Castro's base, uh, he was about to take over the island, but his, his military men were up in the mountains nearby Guantanamo. So they started coming down into the, the base to break in the PX and, and the restaurants and get some food. So then I got assigned as a, a base patrolman. You know, they gave us a gun and they gave us an assignment to a place to guard to keep the, from Castro soldiers coming down, breaking into things. 
And uh, so that was uh, an interesting thing. And I, I didn't get, get into any conflicts with anybody, but I was just, uh, again, it was a night job. I worked, I knew how to work midnights to eight. And um, then when I got discharged, then, then Castro took over the island. At the time I was there, Batista was the, uh, he was a dictator and he, he ran a tough ship and the, and the people didn't like him. And then so, um, so that's what triggered the revolution that Castro, uh, you know, was part of, or led. But anyway, so that was it. It was just a wonderful time of my life. You know, so like I said, you know, what did I learn down in uh, Guantanamo? I was down there for two and a half years, say, two years. And uh, I learned how to fire a, a 45 caliber pistol, pretty good. I learned how to swab a deck. I learned how to drive a two and a half ton truck. I learned about sex in the red light district in the adjoining uh, island, Caminero. And I actually, I got a GED diploma down. I had quit school. My father said, Finn, get a GED, uh, a general equivalency diploma from the US military. So I went there after Chow, or before Chow, I think, after in the afternoon. I took four tests. And then um, uh, I scored well enough to get my high school equivalency, never knowing how important that was going to be in my future. So uh, I got that and uh, I had a couple of, I saved a couple of thousand dollars. I had one of those annuity sign up plans in the US government. And when I got out of the Navy, I think I had more money than my mother or father because of that couple of thousand dollar plan. Well, that was it. I, I actually, you know, it sounds, you know, strange, but I, I really enjoyed the Navy life. And of course, it, you know, I, I became a man in the U.S. Navy, you know, among those other uh, sailors. But uh, one of the things, one of my last tours, or one of near, near my last tour, so I'm, I'm, I'm in the barracks there, and my buddy is, you know, and I was a party guy. The reason I joined the Navy is in Sunnyside. Uh, our, uh, most of our ideas, the guys I grew up with, most of our ideas of being a man were standing at a bar on 48th Avenue of Queens Boulevard drinking a beer. So we were heavy drinkers from, from 16, 17 until I got into the Navy. I mean, I was really good going, getting into trouble drinking. I made $35 a week and I spent it every weekend drinking at the Venice Bar, Allen's Bar on Queens Boulevard, and then those other bars. Uh, on the airline club on 48th Avenue. So, so I was not doing anything. So we, when we joined the Navy, at least I learned how to drive a truck, got a GED diploma, fire a gun, uh, and learned about sex in it uh, on the, the island uh, nearby. But so I, so the, so I'm getting discharged. And I, so I party most of the time. After I got off that spray truck, before I got on there, I did a lot of drinking at uh, the naval base, and I didn't study for any rank. I would come down there as a three striper, you know, and I left there as a three striper, uh, no promotions. So near the end of my assignment there, thinking about what am I going to do when I get out of the Navy, my buddy was packing his sea bag. So we were talking, I, what are you gonna do? We, he told me what he was gonna do, but he was a first class, I don't know, sonar man, radar man, but he had made three promotions. You know, he, so he was a first class petty officer and I was still a triple striper. So, you know, I laid in bed after he left. I said, I really wasted this three and a half years. So um, I was getting the message, you know, this, so, so, so that was the first time I realized that I have to do something. So while I was in there near the end of my career, and my father urged me to get the GED diploma, he also did a great thing for me. He worked for the city. He was a, uh, he worked for the controller's office. He was a clerk, but he knew the city well. So he 
put the application in for the firefighters test. I got out this judge uh, May 11, 1956. The fireman's test was May 21st, 1956, which was a, a very a two week period, a week period. But he sent me the ARCO books. These were study guides to prepare. They were from all the old tests. So I used to be on the boat, you know, rocking back and forth, taking these tests in this ARCO book, they called it. You know, and I'd get a 50 on the test, I'd erase the answers, do it again. And then uh, I got my marks going up a little bit, a little bit. And I do remember I got involved in, uh, in words. I got, I was in the boat shed and they had a dictionary. I kept looking up words, you know, what is a rodent? You know, what, is it a, an animal, a fish? So I, I got involved in the words. I was not good at math. So I uh, kept taking these tests from this uh, study guidebook. And when I got out, you know, I went to one class in uh, Delahanty's Institute, it was called, preparing guys for the fireman's test, which was May 21st, 1956. You know, and the guy said, how long have you been coming here? I said, my first class. He said, you don't have a chance. So, you know, I, I accepted that, but uh, I passed. What is, I took that test two weeks later and I passed it. I got a 78 and uh, I, I got all of the hydraulic questions wrong. I got all the English questions correct, the word questions. I understood the words. So, uh, and that was because of that dictionary. Now, uh, so that set my life. And uh, so when I go down for the investigation in 1956, in the end of 56, uh, the fire department comes out with a new requirement in 1956 that all new recruits have to have a high school diploma. Before 1956, you did not have to have a high school diploma. We were the first class that required, today I, they require college, I believe, uh, two years of college. But uh, so I am at the investigation desk uh, and I show them my US Army GED diploma. So the guy said, oh, that's no good. You need a New York State diploma. That's no good, we don't, we don't recognize that. <laughs> so there was a woman walking by. She said, I'm a major, I was a retired major in the Air Force. Never forget this woman. She said, you take that Army certificate, GED diploma, send it to the New York State and you will get a, U, a US uh, State uh, high school diploma. So I, I do that now I'm held up in the investigation. I didn't get hold of, my appointment was scheduled for February 1st, 1957. But uh, so now I'm hustling to get that high school diploma. So I, uh, we, my father and I, we mail it away to the state. So I remember like, I'm supposed to report Monday morning. February 1st, down to 30 engine. It's a firehouse, no longer open, but it was, it was like an administrative building to get sworn in on a Monday morning. And I got no New York State diploma. I'm sitting in the kitchen with my father. You know, we're, we're, and we're talking angrily about state workers versus city workers. He's a city worker. So um, anyway, I said, I guess, you know, and he's um, saying, well, I guess I'm not going to go down there Monday. I don't have that diploma. So the doorbell rings and my father answered. The mailman is there. He says, Vince, I think you're looking for this. It was my uh, uh, New York State high school diploma. So I went down that Monday. It was a Saturday that Monday. I showed them my New York State diploma and I became a fireman. I was sworn in as a fireman. February 1st, 1957. So uh, that was uh, uh, the beginning of the greatest time of my life, you know? So uh, that's how it all became. So I guess, uh, so there was two stories there. One story was, I wanna say, um, I got on the fire service 
And I, one day I'm over at my mother's house, a few years later, five years later, and I'm talking to her, my father. I see on the desk there, there's a dictionary, a dictionary that I use to look up the words for the fireman's desk. And I open up the dictionary, it says, you property of U.S. Naval Station boat shed. Jesus, I stole this. I put it in my sea bag, you know, and I said, I, I stole this thing. So uh, it haunted me, you know. I, I kept saying, well, someday I'm going to uh, send the, 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 uh, the a dictionary back down there. So now I retired, and it was... Uh, it was when I wrote this memoir, I wrote a memoir last year. When I'm writing a memoir, I start talking about the dictionary. So I, I, I go online, US Navy, I get this chat room with a sailor. And I said to the sailor, you know, now I'm a deputy chief, I'm doing well, you know, I'm, I'm retired. I got a great pension. I said, I'd like to send the US Navy thousand dollars or, or a computer uh, for uh, I accidentally I said put a dictionary in my sea bag when I left Guantanamo I want to repay that so guy says we cannot accept any money and he says I doubt if they're going to take a computer from you so he said to me well here's the telephone number of the library in in the Guantanamo so that was the end of the conversation so I get this crazy number, I call it, and nobody answers. And then uh, a couple of days later, I call it again, and, and some lady said, a guy said, Guantanamo, Naval Station Library. <laughs> I almost fell off the chair. I said, you got, hello, how are you doing? My name is Vincent Dunn, I said. Uh, and I want to donate some money or computers to you because I accidentally took a dictionary 65 years ago from your, from the Guantanamo Naval Base. And I used to study that, use that dictionary and study for the promotion to fireman in your library. You had a nice, cool, quiet library, which I used to in, in, on, the, in, on the Naval Base. So I want to repay, I want to send you uh, uh, money or computers and then send one to the Guantanamo Naval Base where I took that library uh, dictionary. So the guy said, look up, he gives me the librarian. And she said, no, no, we cannot accept that. But she said, maybe we'll accept the dictionary. So, okay, so, so I, go, I go to Barnes and Noble and I buy two dictionaries. One's a hundred bucks, the other is $60, big thick dictionary. And I had a tough time in post office mailing them to, Guantanamo, Cuba, you know. Uh, so anyway, but I did. And uh, so they got a big uh, dictionary. And then I also um, uh, mailed my memoir to the librarian. And I put a big inscription in it. Tiffany Fiddler, I think the librarian's name was. Guantanamo Library. So, so that was a story, number one. But that dictionary, you know, was very important in my life. And I feel now my conscience is clear after 60 years. And, and the librarian, and then when I was talking to the librarian, she said, you know, Chief, um, Vincent Dunn, you have renewed my faith in human nature. You know, for after all these years, uh, returning those dictionaries. But anyway, that was nice. So that was uh, story number one. Story number two was, okay, so I, uh, so I get, uh, I, I get assigned to engine five nine in the Harlem in the 137th Street. The address is 180 West 137th Street. Now, so uh, don't know where it is. So I uh, look. I guess I must have looked on the map and I found out where it was. I looked at the train. How do I get there? So I take this train from Lowry, seven train into, I don't know, I guess uh, the, the east side. And then I take the train up to 135th Street, that's the station closest. And I get off, I'm very early, nice sunny day in February. 
So I walk up the two blocks down to 37th Street and Lenox Avenue. Then I walk, I'm walking up west to, to 7th Avenue, looking for a firehouse. So I get to 7th Avenue. I don't see any firehouse. I'm at the corner of 7th Avenue and I'm looking down the street. And I see a garage, what looks like a garage. It's got a green door. We didn't have red doors then and they didn't have the flag out. Then I see the plaque over the, the doorway. I see that's the firehouse. It was right close to 7th Avenue. So uh, it was eight o'clock. I didn't want to go in there. I, don't, I didn't know anything about the fire service. So I take a walk down uh, 7th Avenue on 21st Street. So I remember this day, so I walk down, I have to go to the bathroom. So I take a little walk, I walk into a bar, there's a bar open down there, believe it or not. So I go in, have a beer, I order a beer, I go to the bathroom. So I'm in the bathroom, guy comes in next to me, he said, you want a woman? I said, no, no, thank you. I said, I'm going for a job, you know, so, uh, uh, so I come out, fin I didn't even finish the beer. And then I walk back up to 137th Street, and it was about nine o'clock when I was scheduled to come in, knock on the door, and the uh, guy opens the door, he says, yeah, I'm in the new probie. So he says, go back in the kitchen. So I walk past a van that says Squad One, and then I walk past a 36 Mac pumper that said Engine Five Nine, and the kitchen was in the back on the first floor. So I walked back there and uh, nobody said anything. I sat down, they were watching television, and, and that was it. And then the officer comes running down. Hey, is there a probie here? Is there a probie here? And I said, I raised my hand. I said, I'm the probie. So uh, anyway, so I didn't get the word that I should have been in work clothes. <laughs> there were no work clothes then yet. Uh, Navy shirt, blue shirt, and, and uh, blue pants, dungarees. I'm in khakis and a blue shirt like this. So the officer said, oh, what the heck? What, what are you doing in this outfit? I said, nobody told me to, to, to get work uniform. So now there were so many of us appointed in 1957, it was 300, that they couldn't put them all, put us all in school. So they sent half of the class right out to the firehouse without any training. So I'm in there being in my khakis and blue shirt. So the officer says, get a helmet, get off the rig, get, get a rubber coat and boots that fit you. So I put them by the fire truck back step. So I do that, and uh, uh, 920, we're getting along. <laughs> so I put the gear on, I'm standing on, the, I'm holding on the back step, responding. I said, what the heck am I supposed to do here? I had no clue. And uh, when we get there, I see a firefighter from the squad comes out, and he says it's a, an oil burner fire. It was all black. And so uh, but that was my first fire and uh, that I responded to. So one of your questions is, what were your first fire? There's a lot of first fires. Let's talk about first fires. My first fire, Mike, I was 10 years old. My father used to work as a waiter up in the Melody Lounge in Queens Boulevard. So uh, I'm sleeping <clears throat> and my mother's smoking in bed. And uh, so I'm sound asleep, I'm 10 years old. And I, don't hear, I hear my father yell, Vin, get water. And at that same moment, I jump out of bed. He whips the covers off my mother, you know, that uh, the cigarette burning. And they flare up into the room, this flame, and the sparks shooting all over. And I, and I am in shock. So I run out to the kitchen, and there's a, uh, a pressure cooker pot of remnants of pea soup my mother was cooking that night, but it was filled with water and, and remnants there. So I grab it and I bring it in. He gets my mother off the bed, pours the, the water piece upon the bed. He grabs the mattress and, and spring uh, with, a, with a towel, drags it out the hallway, out to the street, hooks it on the back of his 37 Chevy and takes off down the street with this flaming mattress on his, uh, from the, in the back of the car. And he brings it down to 51st Avenue, makes a right turn, there's a lot there, throws in a lot, comes back. And, uh, you know, uh, my mother was burned, but she didn't want to go to the hospital, not bad, but bad, 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 bad. She didn't want any hospital, all that hand burns. So we're cleaning up the mess. 
wiping up the pea soup that's in the water and then throwing out that burn, stepping on a burn and d- dunking the burn. So my father says to me, what the hell did you bring in the pea soup word remnants for? I said, Dad, the pot was all filled up already. You know, I didn't have to do. So uh, I said later on, I did pretty good at my first post-fire critique. You know, he challenged me and I had a good answer. Dad, it was filled up. It would have taken me longer to put the water in it. So that was it. That was my first fire. So, and then 920 was my first oil burner fire. And then the other first fire was uh, St. Patrick's Night, we're first due now. This, it, you know, I've been going to a lot of fires, but I'm second to, I'm raising a lot of, uh, you know, but this night was probably, it was on the 7th Avenue, 139th Street, and we were first due. So uh, now I'm pulling holes, I'm a probie still, and then there's veteran firefighters. So we stretch an inch and a half hose line up to the third floor, you know, and now we stretch out excess hose and now they force the door to this apartment. When they force the door in there, there's black smoke from roaring out and you can actually hear the fire in the roaring in the back rooms in there. So it's blowing out into the hallway where we're scrambling around trying to get water and get our and, and the kinks out of the hose. I said to myself, the probably, nobody's going to go in there. We're, we're, we're not going to go in there. Well, the guys start to jump over each other trying to get the nozzle to, to go in there. You know, they wanted to go in there. And this one guy, Bob Powers, from the squad, had a mask on, Scott mask, and he grabs the nozzle, and he goes into that apartment. And you have boom, 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 boom. The, the noise of the hollow plaster walls being struck by the, by the uh, heavy stream that, 180 gallons of it, pounding on that walls and ceiling. And he must have hit the kitchen, the dishes are crashing. So now I try to go in, I gotta stay with the hose line. But I, can't, I get hit with the blast of heat. I can't get in there. But I see everybody is crouching down. So if you get below the heat you know, level, uh, you can crawl underneath the heat that's coming out of the uh, hallway top. So then I got in there, I had to stay with the hose line. But that was the first time I saw a fire. And I mean, I remember when I said, oh, these guys, it's the first time, like I said, the first time I saw men do what they said they were going to do on the real combat like that. I said, these guys did it. So I said, I want to be a fireman. And that night, something happened that really uh, converted me into wanting to be a fireman. So so that was it. And then... Um, Another of my, my real first fire, you know, was on 8th Avenue, probably about 139th Street. We spawned up to 8th Avenue. It was two rooms of flaming fire. Good. I didn't have a mask, but uh, I was with the captain, and we got water, and I knocked down the first room, and then we went into the second room, knocked that down, and we actually went out on a fire escape, and we were going to go up to the floor below, above, if there was any fire up there, but there was no fire up there, but that was the first fire that I actually physically put out, you know, with the nozzle. And it was exhilarating. It was like, then I knew, oh, Jesus. And then one other fire, you know, I can't remember it. It was around the area. I think it was, it was a cellar. It was a cellar. And we stretched the hose line down the cellar stairs. And it was a lot of fire. And I was an acting lieutenant. A lieutenant was gone of, on leave and they didn't replace him. So now here I am, I probably had maybe four years in the fire service and I had put out fires, now I'm, I can do that. But now I'm an acting lieutenant behind the nozzle man. So we go down the cellar, we go back to where the fire is, a good body of fire, we knock that down. And then, uh, you know, <clears throat> and then I tell the uh, the chief, uh, engine five nine, well, we get the fire knocked down. Then I realized, I said, you know, I could be a boss. I mean, I could be a fire, I could be a lieutenant, you know. So, so those fires, you know, prompted me to start studying for lieutenant, you know. And uh, you know, you, you know, you saw some great officers in the fire service. But how I rationalized it, I, I'd say, look, I'm not going to be one of those superstars. But but I see a lot of stiffs. There were a lot of officers who did not know how to put fires out. You know, they came from outlying areas. 
to Harlem, a busy fire area. And, you know, we saw they didn't know what they were doing. So I said, look, I may not be the big superstars we had in Harlem, but, but, but I'm going to be better than those guys. I, there's plenty of room in the middle I can fit in. And then you do that. So that gave me the confidence. And uh, I said, well, let me tell you about studying. You mind if I ramble on like this, Mike? No, that's fine by me. You're carrying the show tonight, my friend. It's your story. You tell it. <clears throat> okay, because I've been over this a few times. But if you want to interrupt, you know, I'd be my guest. So <clears throat> another thing, I'm uh, I'm a rookie firefighter. I've probably got about a year, maybe not even a year. In, in a, so I'm a proby, they call us, probationary firefighter, rookie. Nobody pays any attention to you. All you do is you make the coffee. You got to make sure there's coffee and you got to clean all the dishes. The, you can't leave any dishes in the sink. They've got to be on the dryer rack. And uh, you got to clean the firehouse and, and do everything that anybody tells you to do. You, you're just a, you're the go-to guy clean. So uh, so then there's a, I, hey, we're getting a new probie, they said. So I think, well, now I won't be the junior man. I'll have somebody I can maybe boss around. So uh, maybe I have nine months a year tops. Well, in comes this new probie we get. His name is Frank Lamuschio. And uh, he's different, a different type of guy. Comes in, he's got a college sweater on. He's smoking a pipe. He's got his attitude. He's a weightlifter, big, hefty guy. Uh, uh, so very ambitious. So with the new probie, so he gets acclimated. And we bond, we start the bond because, you know, we're the two guys with no credibility in the firehouse. So Frank is very ambitious. So he says, Vin, uh, you, and I don't have any ambition. I've been wasting, you know, my time in the Navy. And now, you know, I'm looking at this fire career as another wasteful time if I don't get my act together. So he says to me, Vin, you're a, you're a veteran, you were in the Navy. You know, you got the GI Bill, they, they pay you to go to school. Up schools, you and I go to take some fire courses. They started a new course out in uh, Queens College, fire administration course. You know, he said, uh, let's, let's go out there, and enroll in the fire administration course, learn about our job, and get paid by the GI Bill. <laughs> you know what I mean? So we go out to Queens College and we join and we start to take these classes. They have an associate's degree, 64 credits in fire administration, and 34 credits are courses about fire department, strategy, tactics, you know, uh, uh, legal aspects of fire protection. And then the other 30, 32 credits are liberal arts courses. You know, you got to take English and math and, which, you know, and um, philosophy and uh, so they're liberal arts courses. So we we do, we, we start that, we're getting paid stipend. It's not a real big deal. But, but back then, a credit was $18, you know? So, uh, you know, I didn't even enroll, truthfully. I went to, I started going there and taking courses as non-matriculating non -matriculating student. I would pay the 18 bucks out of my GI Bill stipend, but I did not want to, sign up, have some, some administrator say, oh, take 10 credits. I knew I couldn't take 10 credits. I had no high school. I, I, I had no foundation for this college. It was a hot, college, Queens College was a, a major difficult college to get into. So, but we're in there on the fire course. So, so, uh, uh, so, so uh, anyway, so I went and took my courses and got A's and B's in the fire courses, and got C's, uh, all C's, and maybe a couple of B's in uh, my uh, liberal arts courses. And oh yeah, so, so then, so then I, I follow the brochure very carefully. You know, they used to tell you what courses you have to take for a bachelor's degree, 128, for an associate degree, 64. And for our particular one, they actually listed them and told you what courses to take. So I took them religiously. So when I had my 64 credits that I paid for and never never registered in the school, 
I never wanted to matriculate. That word was scary. So I go to the administrator's office and I said, yes, I uh, would like a degree. I took the courses for my associate degree. Would like to apply for, for an associate degree from Queens College. So she can, she said, wait a minute, wait a minute. You never registered? And you are asking us for, a, a, I said, miss, I paid for those courses out of my own pocket. And I was uh, reluctant to matriculate for fear I would get a loan that I couldn't uh, successfully complete. So she was very angry that I did that. But that's how I got my associate degree. And she put on my, uh, not, not my actual certificate. I got my certificate upstairs. But she put on my record. She said, he registered in order to graduate, to get a degree. So she was angry. But anyway, that's how I got my, uh, that morning I went for my bachelor's degree there. I registered, and I registered my master's degree too. So uh, thank God for Queens College, and thank God for the GI Bill. Because when I was going as a chief officer for my master's degree, I think they paid the first couple of, the first semester. Then I ran out of credits. You know what, the reason I went so long with the GI Bill, I got discharged in, uh, 56, 1956, and I was in the Korean War GI Bill, Bill GI Bill under the GI Bill, and then when the Vietnam War came out, and they started to give the Vietnam soldiers and sailors the GI Bill, they started it. Uh, they started in 1955, January 1st of 55. So now I got included in that last year. Uh, from 55 to 50, to May of 56, I got another year and a half GI Bill. And then they doubled it, you know, for the for the Vietnam guy. He said two days for every day. So that, that kept me going. And then, uh, so, so that was a very good thing for me. And I continually went to school, you know, getting stipend from the GI Bill. And uh, so, so it gave me the little economic incentive and I, I got, you know, I got to be able to do the college work, study very hard, I had to do, had to study twice as hard as an average student. But, uh, but that was Frank Lemuskia, the guy who got me started there. And then of course, after, after we started going to the college, Frank and I, then Frank says, hey, Finn, this guy, he was very, in a firehouse, he says to me, come on, you see the host town? On top of the firehouse, there's a big room uh, that has a, uh, uh, pulleys, and when you go to a fire, when you have wet hose, the guys put this hose in this door on the apparatus floor, and the two probies go up to the hose tower, and they pull up these heavy hose lines, and then hook them on hooks, so they dry these these fifty pound hose. So Frank and I were always up there hooking up the wet hose. So Frank says, you know, this is a nice place on top of the firehouse. We had an apparatus floor, bunk room floor, and a top room, top floor, third floor for lockers, you know, where we changed. And then we had a, we had a host tower room on, on the roof, like a penthouse. So Frank says, you know, Vin, let's get a desk up there. We can study. Let's get uh, some weights. He was a weightlifter. We got late, we lift weights up there. We got a punching bag on the top floor. So Frank and I were always working out and uh, trying to stay in shape. And uh, so, so that was it. So now, then he says to us, Finn, we're going to college for these five courses. And we're getting pretty good marks. We're getting good marks in the college course. And uh, he says, what do you say we start to study for lieutenant? Well, geez. So now we start to study for lieutenant with another guy, another probe. Well, the, the firemen are furious. You know, it's, what the heck? You guys aren't even firemen. You know, they said, and you want to be a boss? So, uh, you know, we didn't have an answer for that question, but uh, we, we did. And you know what it was like, I, I wrote, you know, one time in a firehouse, you learn life and death, how to survive firefighting by these veteran firefighters. And, and that's the most important lesson you learn. But when we were going to Queens College, taking this fire administration course, we're being taught by these 
captains, battalion chiefs, rising stars, and deputy chiefs. And actually, one guy was a chief of fire prevention. He was telling us about uh, inspections and, and uh, doing surveys and ship fires and pier fires. And, and then another guy was telling us how to do firefighting strategy. And so we were learning the big picture at college. And, you know, and that was a very new thing in the 59s and 60s. John Jay hadn't started yet. The, the fire community hadn't really blossomed into giving college degrees. But Frank and I were at this course, which they eventually dropped to uh, from Queens College. And we were getting big picture, big picture stories from big chiefs. And then we were learning life and death lessons in the fires, which were most important. So then we saw, well, we, you know, those big chiefs were not uh, upset about young firefighters studying for officers. They thought that was great. So we were getting two worlds. I called that two worlds. I got the micro uh, firefighting world in the firehouse. And then we got the macro firefighting world in Queens College with these chiefs teaching us about strategy and tactics and peer fires and plane fires and, and uh, high rise fires which I had tenements, I was a tenement expert, you know, from my Harlem uh, fires, but I never knew about high rise fires or private dwelling fires or road dwelling fires or pier fires, or ship fires or plane fires. I was getting that at school. So we were getting a, a big uh, education. So Frank and I started studying and uh, we went up the ranks. So he was a, a big person in my life. It took me a while to realize that a lot, a lot of guys were turned off by, by his ambition. He was really ambitious. I mean, much more ambitious than I was. He went on to become uh, a vice president in the union. I became a, a big official in the uh, Colombian society, uh, the, the Italian American society, a fire department. His wife became a, uh, 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 flight. Uh, she she booked flights for all chiefs, and he was like the master of ceremonies on these flights for big chiefs. So they had a flying uh, business, and he de invested in real estate in Astoria. So the guy really was, and he he's got a five million dollar house in a by the water in my neighborhood out there. Uh, so uh, he was very ambitious and he was a very important part, part of my life. And like I say, a lot of guys did not like his, his uh, ambition, but I liked it. And, and, the, and the story is that one day I said to him, Frank, where, where did you get this ambition from? Where did you, uh, what did your father do? And he says, Finn, my father was a nice man. My father uh, was a nice man in the story. He hooked these big 50, 100 pound kegs of ice on his back, climbed five stories, brought them up into some woman's kitchen, chopped it up into a little ice, put it in the refrigerator. His father was an ice man. And he said, I'm not gonna be an ice man. And he never, he never did. He got his, and like when we were with probies, uh, he was going, so we started school. He was going for education. I was going for the fire degree. So then he goes over to a school on 139th street and he applies for a job, you know, he says, you know, I'm going to be a, I'm going to school for to be a teacher. Any chance of getting a job? Back in '59, it says, well, they give him a, a, a New York school system gives him a, a job in the public school system on, on 139th Street. You know, he had not significant classes, you know, but he was like a substitute teacher. But uh, so he was very ambitious. But uh, he uh, was a big deal in my life. So so that was I always remember. Frank, the Iceman's son, <laughs> you know, anyway, so we become, all right, so I become a lieutenant. So now, uh, so Mike, be, before we go into this thing, what time do you want to knock off? I could do this for a couple of days. Tell me how yeah, many No, uh, no, <laughs> if I didn't want to cut you off, this is volume 35 of the, uh, by the way, of the best, the bravest for the audience, interviews with the FDNY's elite, Deputy oh, Chief but, Vincent Dunn. You give me a time. Nine, you want to do nine o'clock? I'll do till nine, or you want to do eight thirty? 
Tell me what yeah, I mean, usually, to. usually the way I structure the show, I aim it for about 90 minutes or less. But if somebody's on a roll, I'm not, I mean, the audience okay. knows this by now because they know the show. I don't stop them. Okay. So 90 so you've minutes. Been, you've been on a roll before. Minutes. But before you continue, let me just say what's yeah, impressive right. about you getting to lieutenant, I think this is 1964 or so, is yeah. that it's less than 10 years on the job. And here you are already in that position, which is a testament to your ambition, as you were just talking about. It's It was, um, I had seven years on the job. Seven sure. years, that's incredible. Seven years. Uh, and, uh, you know, I, I was set on fire by this guy, Lemuskio. No one, no, and then once you, once I did that firefighting and knew I could be an officer because I was an acting lieutenant at a fire, and put fires out. Then when I uh, became a lieutenant, you know, then I knew I could be there was other ranks there. I could go continue to study and go up there. But I got, I got that. We he we be three of us went up up the ranks. Myself, myself, Frank Lemuski, and another fella. In our class, we went right up and we all became chiefs. So, uh, but anyway, so I became. It was impressive at the time I, to be to be a, a lieutenant. <laughs> Let me tell you how luck plays in. So I am uh, in a fireman waiting. The list is coming out in uh, January of 1964. Now the fire department announces a captain's test for April of, of 1964. The list, my lieutenant's list is supposed to be promulgated January of 1964. We see, Frank Lemuski and I, and a couple other guys see, there's a captain's test being given in, in April. And, and at that time, you just needed to be a lieutenant. You didn't have to have two years or anything. So we knew, we were, we, he said, you know, if we got promoted at the top of that list, we would be able to take that lieutenant as a captain's test. So we're start, we continued to study. Now there was actually a lieutenant, a couple of lieutenants who saw we were such good students. They joined our class because they were studying for captain. And they invited us into the offices. Said, Come on, guys, let's study together. And we had officers in the school in studying with us for this. So we thought there was an outside chance. We didn't know. But we did we did uh, surveys, we, we calculated our our seniority, we calculated, we knew our mark rough, roughly, we knew our mark, and we thought we had a chance to be in that top hundred. So sure enough, we were. I was 51, Frank was 90 something. And we thought we could get promoted before April. Now, there was a chance that wasn't going to happen, but this was a lesson in life. We used to say, supposing we study and we don't get promoted in time to take the captain's test. I'll feel bad, but supposing we don't study and we get promoted in time to take the captain's test. We will really feel bad then. So we felt, let's do the former. Let's take the chance, study. And if we don't get promoted in time to take the cap, no big deal. I mean, it'll, we'll do the next one. But sure enough, we get promoted in time. We take the captain's test. And we're at the, we're at the, the bottom of the captain's test, which was good enough for us to get promoted several years. And, and frankly, when I became a lieutenant, I didn't want to get promoted captain. I knew I wasn't, couldn't be a captain then. But two or three years later, when I did get promoted to captain, waiting on the list, I was ready to be a captain. I knew I could be a captain. So anyway, so I get a, I get assigned a lieutenant, new lieutenant. And I'm covering in Brooklyn for a year, going, they put you in one spot, another spot, this spot. And I wanted to get back to Harlem, you know, where I knew companies, and I put it for a couple of companies, but they don't want to send you back where you came from. They want you to get new the knowledge and, and put you in a different area of the city. So I remember this one firehouse I stopped into, I had covered in one day. For some reason, there was one guy, we were like, you know, oil and water. I don't know, maybe he didn't like the fact that it was 
I don't know. But he gave me a hard time, this, uh, this guy. And so one tour, and I never saw the guy again. I, I actually did, but uh, I said, geez, I, I, any, any house but that house. Well, uh, don't you know, I get assigned to that firehouse. You know, it always, always works out that way, doesn't it? Yeah, they're 33 inches. I said, geez, this is the only house I didn't want because of that one incident with the guy. So now, anyway, I go to the firehouse that morning. I'm now assigned the lieutenant. And, uh, and I came from a very tough firehouse. I mean, Harlem was a tough drinking firehouse, heavy fire loads. We did a lot of firefighting. So when I'm down here, this uh, 33 engine, we did second due to uh, Alphabet City, busy 28 engine. And we, we responded to Hell's 100 Lake Acres, you know, which was uh, now called Soho, but it was old loft buildings filled with rags and heavy machinery that collapsed every time there was a fire and killed firemen. So they were my two response areas. But anyway, so I get to this firehouse. And you know, don't you know the first day, and they said, roll call, roll call. We didn't even do roll call up in Holland. So I go downstairs and I'm the lieutenant and I got the writing list and I've got to call up their names. So I, we do the roll call and they all come up to me and they start shaking my hand. Hey, lieutenant, how you doing? My name is Dozer. It was such a nice welcome. It never happened in any other firehouse I went to. So here, yeah, that was such a change from my one experience with that one guy. So it was a great fire company, a 33 engine. And I really cherished working with them. But anyway, so uh, a new lieutenant. So I go dinner down in the fire. John's ready, go down in the kitchen, uh, eating dinner with the guys and the chief. And we have the first division in quarters. Uh, I'm a lieutenant, deputy chiefs in quarters, and his nine truck and uh, 33 engine, and a lieutenant for the truck, lieutenant for the engine. So anyway, we start to eat dinner, and all the guys say, hey, Chief, we're gonna, we're gonna go, to, uh, lieutenant, we're gonna go down and watch television. So they all take their plates and the dinners and they go down the cellar to watch TV. We didn't, we didn't have a TV in the kitchen. So it's me and the Chief there. So I'm saying, Chief, do you mind if I go down with the guys? No, no, go ahead. So I go down the basement and, uh, you know, they're down there eating. But they're down there drinking, you know. This was a heavy drinking firehouse. Now, we drank beer in the 59 engine, but these guys, a couple of these guys had hot stuff. They had liquor down there, they were drinking whiskey, you know, and beer, lots of beer. But it's, holy geez, I got my hands full of it. And they were workers, they worked in the daytime. And a couple of them were tough getting, you know, we had them three o'clock runs, two o'clock runs. You know, you had to make sure they were up and you know, had to pull them out of bed. So, uh, so it was something, and I said, look, this is gonna be a tough assignment. So I um, I said, how am I gonna get more influence? You know, a little more influence. I'm a new officer, you know, again, you know, you don't develop command uh, respect initially. It takes you a while, two, three years. And uh, I was on captain's list. I knew I was not going to be here five or 10 years. So. I had to figure out how to get more influence into these heavy drinking guys, you know? And, and like I said, one of the guys <laughs> back in the 59, 60, 60, uh, 66, 65, he had tattoos on his hands. That was unusual. You know, and you didn't see many, many tattoos there. I said, oh, geez, this guy. So now I'm in the kitchen, down in the basement one day, keeping the cellar. I said, hey, look, does anybody want to be a lieutenant? I know how to be a lieutenant. I just passed the lieutenant's test. And I was on a captain's list. They knew that. And actually, believe it or not, there was a chance I could take the uh, battalion chief test, you know, about three or four years. So I said, let's study. I'll show you how to be a lieutenant. So a couple of guys, all right, all right, chief. I get about four guys, five guys. And they say, okay, here's what we do. We meet every Wednesday up in the firehouse, come in from our homes, and we'll... Uh, study on the on top floor. You know, I give out assignments, you know, the regulations are number one, the uh, training bullet, the training bullets are number two, uh, the WNYF magazines are training, the number three. And then there was uh, 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 building codes and personnel bulletins we had to learn. So I knew the, I knew the, the importance of each subject that was important. 
the most important subject that you had to learn more than anything was the book of regulations. Most questions came from that. Then there was the uh, uh, firefighting all unit circulars. And then there was the training bulls that we had trained. Well, naturally you had to learn them very good. And then also there were uh, WNYF, our training magazine. Well, I knew the percentage of the study. And we started studying and uh, I told them, well, we get three by five cards. And every, you know, I would sign them 10 pages of the regulation, uh, a couple of pages in WNYF, a couple of pages in the training bulletin, a couple of pages. And I say, you got pages one to five, you got five to six to 10, 11 to 15. And then you were responsible to write up questions and have the answers on the bank, these three by five. And then when we come in on a Wednesday, you know, we would put them in a pile and you, you know, you would, you know, you would distribute them around so everybody could get a chance of asking the question, but you know, they would ask the person to the left the answer. And if he didn't know the answer, somebody would have to know it and he'd go around and then we knew the answer. So that was it. So anyway, uh, so that got to be, uh, I got a lot of influence by those, that test. I mean, even the chief said, wow, this, this, this lieutenant's pretty good. He's getting the men promoted. And the other firemen who didn't join the class, you know, they started studying on their own. But I started something. But uh, so uh, we all got promoted. We all went up the ranks. And here's the kicker to the story. Uh, so during this, during this studying, five guys here, one guy with the tattoos on his hands, so he, he, he would wipe off the table before we started, wipe it down. And then he said, uh, uh, Chief, hey, Cap, hey, hey, Lieutenant, I'll hand out the cards. Got to hand out the cards to the guy. And then he said, Cap, I'll give out the homework assignments. And well, I'm joining in too. I'm studying too. I'm part of this class. So uh, when he started giving out the homework and stuff, he was really taking over the class, which was good for me. I mean, uh, so anyway, uh, he gets promoted, we all get promoted. So 30 years later, I'm the division commander in the third division, Midtown Manhattan. There's a big shuffle of the top headquarters commanders. There's a new assistant chief of Manhattan assigned to our quarters, the big office upstairs. And uh, he comes walking into the firehouse, the assistant chief, in charge of the borough of Manhattan, it's the guy with the tattoos on his hands, you know, and Eddie Butler, <laughs> he says, how you been? I said, hey, Chief, how you doing? Uh, and then we became very good, you know, we knew each other, and uh, we became very good friends, and uh, I could do no wrong with Eddie Butler, so I got him uh, promoted lieutenant, but he, he had, he went on beyond me, so he became my boss, so how's that? So I get this fireman promoted, and then near the end of our careers, he becomes my boss. So that was very satisfying too. And we still friends together. We go out to dinner together. But uh, so that was how I. So all right. So now another story. So I get promoted captain. So now I'm promoted captain, and uh, I get assigned to uh, cover for in Brooklyn again for a year, and then I get assigned to. Uh, back to Harlem, which I wanted to go. I wanted to go back up there. So I get assigned to this place called the Fire Factory. You know, and I like what you said, the honor of working on Fifth Avenue. <laughs> you know, the prestige of working on Fifth Avenue, but it was very charm. Charm, but it was a very busy part of Fifth Avenue, you know. Uh, so anyway, but anyway, it was called the Fire Factory because uh, it produced a lot of fires and we extinguished a lot of fires in this so-called fire factory. So I get assigned up there. Now these guys are tough. Uh, and again, tough bunch of firefighters. These guys are very busy, busier than all of my firehouses put together. So now I got to keep up. And that's where I met John Bezos' son, uh, father. You know, he was a fireman. And you know, we went to fires together. John Bezos' father was a tremendous firefighter. I was learning as a captain. I was learning from John Bay Bezer's father, believe it or not, Bobby Bezer. So anyway, he was in my group. We went to a couple of good fires together. But anyway, so now the captain up there, 
And uh, again, tough guys. I got to get some credibility. You know, they don't pay any attention to you. You know, so I said, again, anybody wants to be a lieutenant? I know how to get promoted. Uh, I was studying. Now I was studying for the battalion chief's test. Let's come meet every Wednesday. We cleared a place in the locker room, table, did the same assignment of, uh, I had about five guys, and uh, we started this class. We'd come in every night, every Wednesday night, and we would go through the motions of studying. So uh, anyway, so that was it. Then they were good, but point is, so one day, you know, firemen, they, you know, I had gone to college. I knew how to spend two hours studying alone. My wife and family acknowledged that with me. My wife was very pleased that I went to college. Her father didn't. So she didn't mind when I left her and went down to study for whatever it was, the promotion or college. But most most working men never study alone, you know, read a book. I mean, most working guys are hardworking people. So anyway, one day we're studying for six months and this firefighter comes in Danny Harris was his name. And he says to me, uh, Chief, my wife told me to tell you to go fuck yourself. Excuse me, Mike, I'm sorry. I know you don't like, you don't like cursing. But he, he tells me, my wife said to go F yourself. I says, Danny, what did I say? I, what did I do to her? He says, you took me from her and the kids for two hours, when I went downstairs to study for this class, she is furious <laughs> with you. So I, said, so I said, Danny, when you make lieutenant uh, and you bring home that first paycheck, she will forgive you and she'll forgive me too. So I knew that, I knew that for a fact. Sorry about the crazy mic, but, uh, but anyway, uh, uh, that was it. You know? So that was how I got the credibility there. And that helped me study for Battalion chiefs, uh, and I became a battalion chief. And uh, and then again, again, my timing is everything. I, I'm getting promoted off the end of this battalion chief list, and lo and behold, the deputy there's a deputies list coming up, the de de deputies test coming up. So now I'm saying uh, I got the same dilemma. If I get promoted in time to take the deputy says, I should start studying now for six months of my life. Uh, I said, and if I don't study and get a chance to take the deputy's test, uh, I will feel bad. Uh, but if I uh, feel worse than if I study and, and don't and miss out on the test. So again, I did the positive thing and I studied and sure enough, I was lucked out. I think I got promoted the next month. The deputy's test was given and I passed it. So now I'm at the bottom. I'm at the, there were 31 uh, chiefs, battalion chiefs on the deputy's list. <clears throat> I think I was 31. <clears throat> but it was funny. It was funny. I, uh, it was the highest position. I, I was 51 on my lieutenant's test. I was 31 on the deputy's list. But it was the lowest mark I ever wrote. I think it was like a 70. I got on with a 71. Uh, but, uh, but I was 31. And sure enough, I was lucky enough, they made the whole list and I became a deputy chief. I got assigned to uh, 7th Division in the Bronx. And uh, I, uh, I loved being a deputy chief. I mean, that was my, for some reason, as, even as a fireman, I, I wanted to be a deputy chief, I said. That was my goal, and and that was it. And then I went, I went down to headquarters, and you know they, they thought I was a rising star, so they called me down. I was a new, new uh, was I a deputy? Yeah, I think in 1977, I suppose you were. And you know the thing before you continue that amazes me is that what? it felt like at 20 years into your career by this point you were just getting started because there was still so much more that you did. So the rising star moniker definitely fit. Uh, Mike, you cannot, you know, you cannot believe it. I thought my life was over. I had a middle. Of, I go down to, so they call me down to headquarters at, in 1974 as a battalion chief. They know I'm on, they can see I'm on the deputies list. 
So now they get me down to planning, and I'm down there with these big, you know, I know everybody say, oh, you're a rising star kid. They give me this assignment with Brooklyn Polytech to do these research fires, full-scale fires and road dwellings, and to see how the fire spreads in the common roof space. Bushwick was burning down. Uh, we couldn't stop the fires once it got into that common cock loft or common roof space. It would travel over all the buildings. 10 buildings in the street would be burned out from water damage and fire on the, in that space. So they, I had this assignment with Brooklyn Polytech to, to, to we did 24 fires, full scale fires. We burned these four road dwellings down. The little fires, big fires, middle fires. Now after I'm finished, I got to write a paper. I have a college degree. I finished my college degree, and I and uh, I'm on the deputies list, and I have an assignment by the headquarters to write this thing, this paper, and I can't write the paper. You know, I, I got this. Who am I? You know, it's a humble pie thing. Who am I? Oh Lord, I am not worthy. You know, the, I'm a new battalion chief. I got to write this big story to other chiefs, and I just had this, this, uh, and not a writer's block. It was just like couldn't see myself saying anything in, in to the rest of the fire department. So anyway, so I leave headquarters with the planning with my tail between my legs. I get promoted deputy, I go to the Bronx. So now I'm in the, the Bronx, I'm a deputy. I got my life's dream, you know. So um, I'm in the seventh division. My first day I go into the division, I hear this senior deputy saying, I don't care on the phone. He's on the phone with the head, with the Bronx Borough Command. I don't care. I'm not writing a, an article for WNYF, a training magazine. It's not in my job description. I'm calling the union. Forget. I don't do that. I'm not a writer. So, so I hear this guy say, so, "Oh, geez, I'm going to get this assignment. I'm the kid." So he slams the phone down. So I have my first big eight in the Bronx. They had these we call them H type buildings. There were two apartment houses, two tenements connected together by a center core. So we call them, they, from a bird's eye view, they looked like an H. Sometimes they were triple H's, uh, like an E, but, but we call them H type building. There were two tenements together connected with a foyer and an elevator, maybe or a stairway. So I have a major fire on one of them. There's a collapse, it's a fifth alarm fire. So now I'm learning about these new buildings. I knew tenements. I knew tenements. I was an expert at tenement fire. I didn't know about these H types. So I do all kinds of research, a research on these uh, H type buildings, figuring I'm going to get that assignment that the other chief was complaining about. So I write this big article for my own self. It was about classic fire in an H type building. It was arson fire, collapse fire, fifth alarm fire. So I analyzed the construction, how the fire spread, the arson problem, how the building collapsed. So I sent it to the borough commander. I don't know why, I sent it. Possible submission for WNYF. So the borough commander assistant called me back, he says, Vin, uh, thanks, but no thanks. You know, the borough commander is gonna write a big, big bulletin on these building, these H's. We didn't know how to, we didn't know how to extinguish these H type buildings. It were a new fire. Uh, the, the cutting edge of the firestorm had moved to the Bronx, the North Bronx, where we had these big apartment houses, grand concourse, giant apartment houses, combustible interiors. So we were struggling learning how to do those. We now know how to do those H type fires. But uh, anyway, so he said, no thanks, but the borough command is gonna write a whole big thing. So now, okay, so at least I knew I could you know, I, I just took stuff from all over. I put it together and I talked a little bit about my fire, but it was really like a study thing for me. So then I go on with my life, learning to be a deputy in the Bronx and there's a lot of fire, many more fires than any place I worked. And uh, so uh, one day I relieve this uh, veteran chief up there <clears throat> and he said, yeah, we had a tax rate, third alarm fire in, in Manhattan last night. And <clears throat> we would respond to North Bronx and Manhattan. So he said, the, the parable wall collapse. As he's leaving, he's leaving the firehouse. <clears throat> That's all. One line, he tells the parable wall collapse. So <clears throat> we do all administration work that morning. So I said to the driver, let's take a ride over and look at Harry's fire. 
I walk, I go over to drive over to Manhattan to this fire with a row of stores. The parable wall had collapsed into the street. There was four feet of stone for a hundred feet on the sidewalk. I am shocked. I said, wait a minute. The, the call headquarters, get me the photo unit up here. Give me a pad and pencil, and I'm going to start to draw this. I want the photo unit to photograph this wall that came down in a wave. You know, uh, it, one part of it came down and it was all tied together with iron bar. It was a it was a cast stone, parable wall with an overhang. Came down in a wave. So uh, I wrote this article. I, oh, I had to write this up. I write about parable wall collapse. And in the article, you know, I'm now a deputy. Now I start to think about uh, a fire I had in 23rd Street where 12 guys got killed. Now I'm saying I got a responsibility here. I'm the deputy. So uh, I got to make sure my firefighters don't get killed with collapse. Now that thing that I was post traumatic stress that had come out on me as a deputy, I never thought about that after. We got this fire where 12 firemen died. <clears throat> but 10 years, 11 years later, I'm a deputy. Now I'm thinking about this collapse. So now I see this parable walls are recurrent collapse danger. I write this article. And as I write the article near the end, it's well, who's responsible when guys get killed at a collapse? I said, who is responsible? I said, well, the, the incident commander, the deputy, the buck stops with him. He's the, you know, he's the final responsibility. However, at a big fire, I assigned a sector chief, another chief officer, sector two, sector three, the rear, sector four, the right side. And that sector chief is responsible for that sector, for lives of the firefighters working in that sector, in their sectors. And the company officer, who's operating around this fire is responsible for the firefighters in his unit. And then the firefighters are responsible to listen to the company officer and follow his direction and not freelance. So I'm not saying that the ultimate responsibility is the incident commander, but there's, there's shared responsibility with sector officer. Do we call them division officer, sector chief? There's shared responsibility with company officers and there's shared responsibility with firefighters. One man can't make a fire scene safe. One chief can't make that. But the team of sector chiefs, <clears throat> company officers and firefighters do what they're supposed to do. That's how safety comes about in the fire service. So anyway, so <clears throat> I write that at the end of the article. After I describe how a powerful wall came down on a wave, how one fireman thought he was just going to worry about the one bulge. And when the bulge came down and swept down, he had to jump on over a car to keep the safe gun. So, and then I, I talked about other parable wall collapses, you know, which it killed firefighters. So it was a good article, but I added that section about shared responsibility. Okay, so now I send it in to the bar. I never hear about it. Never, you know, that was nothing. So, uh, so anyway, uh, a couple of months later, August, I, I get a call, August, I guess August 5th, 1978, I get a call from, from this guy, Bernie Neer. He's the editor of our training magazine, W and Where. He says, who the heck do you think you are? I done, who the, who, uh, Chief Dunn, who do you think you are? Well, what are you, some kind of, what, ben, Bernie, what are you talking about? He says, the chief of the department told me to stop the magazine, put your article in the magazine. You know, I, I, I never heard of this, he said. I said. Bernie, I don't know the chief. I did not ask him to put that in there. If he did it, that's his decision. What had happened was, I submitted that article about a powerful wall cops in the Bronx. But in Brooklyn, there's a, there's a uh, timber truss roof uh, that collapses and kills six firefighters. And what the chief of the department liked in my article was that little section where I talk about who's responsible. The incident commander, the buck stops with the incident commander. 
but it's shared with sector and division officers. It's shared with company. So the chief evidently loved that part of it. And he added his own, he had written a few articles. He put that in the bibliography. So anyway, that's why he wanted it stopped. And that article put in, and it was a tragic time. I mean, August 6th, 1978, the wall bombs collapsed, trust roof collapsed. My, my article was about parapet walls, and that was a trust roof collapse. But I put that section in about responsibility on the firecraft, which traded all the, all the interest. So that was it. And uh, so then the, <laughs> the borough commander called me up and he said, Finn, you got that article on the H type building you wrote to, to a year ago that we said that we didn't want to use? I said, Yeah, I still got it. Send it to us. But then I was a, a rising star writer in the fire department from that day on. And I, and I did have, a, I kept writing. I loved the writing. And uh, so then I, uh, I, uh, I submitted. I so I got friendly with Bernie Neer, the editor of WNWF. And I, I know, I said to Bernie one day, and I, I said, Bernie, I'm going to write more articles for your magazine than any other fire chief in the history of your magazine. And I wrote 14. But some guy just surpassed me. Ah, his name. But I had pretty good. I did 14. And uh, uh, so so that was uh, how I became the writer. And then, oh, yeah, so, right, so now, what are your questions? So, uh, well, two things. So I'm in a division. And I got my degrees. And I did a little teaching as a captain. Believe it or not, I got I, a division of training asked me to teach it course on fire prevention at night. I got paid for it from, a, from, from the city to teach fire prevention. And I did about three years. I taught I would go over to division of training at night and teach firefighters only about fire prevention. And I did the building code. I, I love the building laws and the code, but I really taught a lot about that. So I had a little experience teaching. So then uh, uh, you had the MGM fire in 1980 at a major hotel fire in Las Vegas. And then you had the uh, Indianapolis Skywalk collapse. So Bob Spinner, he was the chairman of Manhattan College. He lives next door to a fire lieutenant in my firehouse. And he says, do you know anybody who could teach a course to engineers up here, fire design? So this guy, Jimmy Sheeran, comes in. Would you be interested? I said, you know, I would be interested. I had my degrees. I had a master's degree then. And I wanted, to, the challenge was, I said, I wonder if I could teach to somebody who wasn't a firefighter. I couldn't use jargon. I, I couldn't, you know, I had to, I was talking to engineering students who knew more about engineering than I did. But I uh, would talk about fire protection design, which I know more about than they did. But um, I couldn't use any fire department jargon. You know, they knew nothing about, so, so that was my challenge. I had to learn to speak to people, you know, like yourself, who are not fire, uh, who had a fire background. So uh, I did that for two years, very difficult, <clears throat> very difficult. I was an associate professor. They gave me this assistant professor, I think. But, the, you know, and we did a big uh, engineering seminar up there, but very tough, very, very. Not only did I teach these, teaching is one thing, but I had to develop a course. I had to develop 16 lesson plans, you know, which, and subject matter. So, so that was a killer, but it was a challenge that I, that I'm still affected me. So that was it. And then, uh, then another night I'm in the division, Dennis Smith, the, the big author who wrote the report from engine 82, a bestseller. It was, it was a bestseller, but in the fire service and in the public, you know, I, I write for firefighters. I don't write for the general public, but Dennis, Dennis's book, Report from 82, captured the imagination of the country. And uh, that book was a bestseller. And like, <clears throat> like uh, he caught the wave of urban, the urban centers were burning, Chicago, New York, Philly. Uh, and uh, there was another trend. It was uh, working men authors. There was a guy, Joseph, Romberg, Romberg, and he was a cop on the West Coast, and Dennis was a fireman on the East Coast. So there was like working men's literature that became popular. So, uh, so that book, he, he it's, it's, 
took off and became a bestseller. So he wanted, he had, so he, he was very, Dennis Smith was a, an amazing guy. He writes this book. He's working in 82 engine, a busy place in South Bronx. Writes this best selling book. Now he gets probably a hundred grand. It was $7 a book. Probably gets $125, uh, $125,000. Then there's a movie rights grab the book. So there's another 100,000 he gets. Now uh, he knows he's sitting on something big with this fire service. Nobody's ever, nobody ever grabbed the fire service. And there was one magazine that wasn't really doing much. So he writes every single fire chief in America, <clears throat> volunteer and volunteer and paid, and gets their mailing list of their firefighters. And he sends out subscriptions to a magazine. This magazine takes off. You know, this magazine is mainly fire volunteer firefighters and paid firefighters. But the point there in America, in America, most people don't realize there's about a million, million three firefighters. A, mil a million of them or 900,000 are volunteers. There's only about three, 400 paid firefighters. So his magazine, Firehouse, is, is a bigger audience than other magazines which were directed towards career. So he comes up with this magazine that becomes the best-selling magazine. Uh, he also now uh, starts to do seminars. He rents out uh, the inner harbor was just being redeveloped. He now starts to do expos, uh, firehouse expo down in the inner harbor. Harbor. So he then he and then he starts to do training videos. Firehouse. To, I get become a, a technical advisor, but training and he's selling training videos. It was so new. Videos were so new. He had to sell the TV recorder. Nobody had TV recorders then. But that was a hot thing. He's selling these fire training videos to fire about. He's got a firehouse expo. He's got this magazine as the biggest seller. And now he starts, <coughs> he actually sold, he, he, <coughs> he gets uh, Calvin Klein and him get together and they get these turnout coats and he's selling them to Bloomingdale's. Uh, fire looking turn uh, coats, Calvin Klein on the Calvin Klein's heading. So the guy was a real entrepreneur. You know, most guys would have gotten a couple hundred grand from Hollywood in the book and spent it, bought a house. But Dennis builds this empire. Now, I'm reading a Wall Street Journal, a Wall Street Journal ad uh, that the ad says it's a puff piece about Dennis Smith. And it's a Dennis Smith mission uh, is to educate, entertain, and equip firefighters of America. And he did it. Entertainment uh, with uh, his magazine, equipment with his turnout gear, and uh, education with his expos. And, you know, when I, so when he, so when, so anyway, so he's got that. So one night, Dennis sends this guy, Harvey Eisner, up to me, my house, and he says, would you write for Dennis Smith's magazine? It's 1980. So uh, I said, yeah. So, so I'm writing for nothing, my WNYF. So he, Dennis will pay me $200 of an article. Oh, I'm in heaven. So I, I, I have to stop from laughing. I tell Harvey Eisner, yeah, count on me. So I start to write for Firehouse Magazine. I wrote for 38 years. Uh, uh, column every, every that's where the books came from. So I wrote the books for him. So Dennis was I uh, yeah, you know again just like my friend Frank. A lot of guys didn't appreciate him. You know a lot of guys uh, you know felt he was not you know he was a proven firefighter. There was no question there, but he was an outlier. He was a different guy. Dennis was different from me. Then Dennis was different from most firefighters. Uh, so, uh, but he did a, a lot of stuff in the fire scene. So like when I first go down to meet him, I go down to 53rd Street off Madison Avenue. I'm coming from a night tour in the South Bronx, in the Bronx at the time, I, I'm, in, I'm in a deputy. I go down to 53rd Street in Madison Avenue. I go into this building with a canopy, gold canopy. 
I get into an elevator with mirrors and wood, polished wood and gold. I take it up to the fifth floor. I get off, there's a room, suite of rooms, firehouse magazine and gold. You know, I go in, there's a secretary that can help you. He had to see Dennis Smith. So, oh, fine. So I see the, I mean, the editor, John Page. Then I go and see, he was the public, he was like the publisher, I guess. Then I go to see uh, another magazine article editor, Elna Soraki, who became very friendly with. And then there's a personal secretary for Dennis, and Dennis is in the back room there. Unbelievable. Five rooms in this beautiful Madison Avenue suite, you know, with all the other uh, book publishing places. So uh, it was stunning. I it was like two worlds. I would leave the Bronx, come down, he'd take me out to a four star restaurant. I mean, I, for lunch. I mean, uh, he wanted to know about the fires where he worked in the, in the Bronx, but he was another guy. He was a strange guy, uh, like my buddy, the Iceman. Nobody liked the Iceman. And I mean, guys appreciated what, what Dennis did, but some guys were jealous, maybe. I don't know. But, but he was different. Dennis was definitely different. But uh, good for me. He, he set my, my writing life. 38 years I wrote for his magazine. And, the, and, and then the only reason, the only reason I, didn't, I would not be writing for his magazine now is when I started writing for Dennis back in 1980, my first article was 1981, September of 81. Uh, I, Dennis didn't ask me to sign a contract. You know, back then nobody cared, you know, writing little fire articles. So I'm writing, I'm writing, and now 10, 20 years, as I write these decade of articles, I realize I got a book here. So now I started producing books, you know, with my articles. Then, you know, I have to rewrite them. And then that's where the books came from. I would write them from my articles first as chapters, as articles, and then they would be chapters. So, uh, but anyway, and then whenever the, the, when the internet came in, firehouse.com. Now, fire, I didn't have a, I, I own my own copyright. Copyright law says when you submit an article, if you don't sign a contract, they get the first rights and then the rights refer back to you. They have first use only, and then the rights refer back to you, the writer. So, uh, uh, so I had the copyrights of all my stuff like for 30 years. So now when firehouse.com comes in, the internet comes in, they have a, they have a digital uh, magazine. And then now they say, well, they want to use my articles for also in the uh, firehouse.com. So I'm pretty savvy by this time. So I'm saying, well, do I get any extra compensation when you take my written article and you have one copyright use of it, and then you start putting it in your firehouse.com for eternity, that thing never leaves that internet. So I would like some compensation. And they said, no, no, we can't do that. And I had a lawyer friend of mine and said, when they reuse your hard copy article in firehouse.com, if you don't, if you don't have a contract, they should give you 50% of the original uh, payment for the written article. And then after two years, they should, you know, cut it out, but they don't do that. The, the internet took over everything. So uh, he, they wanted me to sign a contract after 35 years, myself and another writer, Jim Smith, we objected. Everybody signed up. They didn't care if they used, how many times they used their stuff. But Jim and I were publishing books, so we were concerned about, uh, we wanted to keep their rights. So we didn't, we refused to sign. So then after a while, they kept selling the magazine. Magazine business was not what it was, not what, what it was like when Dennis ran magazine and publishing with big deals back in the 1980s. Today, the magazines are really having a hard time. So uh, uh, they said, Vin, we got new owners. You got to sign. And uh, I said, no, I'm not signing. So I stopped writing after 38 years. But I did good. I thank Dennis, and I thank Firehouse Magazine. I mean, I, that was a big deal, a big uh, opportunity for me. So, 
Yeah. That was it. So that's how you become a writer from, you know, and then when I went down to headquarters, I knew I didn't want to go be, become a headquarters chief. It was too difficult. I mean, with those poli the politics down at headquarters is stunningly difficult. Uh, you know, like I would be down there in planning as a new battalion chief, you know, and I'd say to this, uh, we had a lot of consultants down there. The city was hiring consultants because they were cutting, doing a lot of cutting back in 74, 75. City was bankrupt, 76. So I remember saying to this guy, it's PhD with a suit. Why'd the chief make that decision? That decision made no sense. So he says, chief, he scolded me. Don't you know there are two types of decisions? There are managerial decisions, which make sense and are logical. And then there's a political decision which is not logical and makes no sense. The chief made a political decision. And I said, you know what? I said to myself, I don't think I'm gonna work down here where you have to make political decisions that make no sense. So I went back to the firehouse and I knew I could run a division and I knew I would make managerial decisions only, not too many political decisions. And uh, I don't think any political decision. And uh, I enjoyed my life. I didn't have the political or diplomatic skills. My hat's off to anybody who does work in headquarters because I know how tough it is. I saw it firsthand. It is very hard to work in the headquarters with the politicians down there. Uh, I could not do that. But then, what was it? So you had some very interesting questions, Mike. I like the five questions you uh, had You know, near the end. The rapid fire. Yeah, the rapid fire. Let's see. I mean, that was that was that was they were good. Can we can we can we start on them and maybe call it a night? What do you think? Yeah, that's fine by me. Yeah. Let's let me just get my glasses. Let's see. Then <clears throat> mm -hmm. I'll just say goodbye to the audience. I wrote down some answers, and they were very good questions. Thank uh, you. Mitch. I liked uh, I liked what it said. Uh, okay. All right. So, go ahead. What's the first question? Favorite borough to work in? Was Manhattan. I have to say Manhattan. Mm -hmm. I mean, Manhattan was, I mean, I worked in Harlem. I saw firsthand, you know, the, the problems there. Then I worked in Lower Manhattan. You know, I, I in by Greenwich Village, Great Jones Street, we responded to Alphabet City. Back in the 60s, the hippies were all over. That was a amazing time uh, and then um, uh, you know you had the hippies and, and of course the drugs and all that stuff was going on there and then the comedy club the bit you know then I started taking my wife out to the bitter end and the uh, bottom line we saw all these uh, Woody Allen and all these guys did uh, uh, the boss we saw the boss down the bottom line so we, you know I learned about Manhattan's village Greenwich Village by working in down in, as a lieutenant in 33 engine. Uh, then, uh, then I went, uh, went back to the Bronx. The Bronx was another important part of my life. You know, you saw that part. Then when I got assigned to Midtown Manhattan, then I started going to Broadway shows with my wife. You know, you, you know I did my high rise firefighting, but Broadway was there. Then the Upper East Side, you know, some of the restaurants, we'd go out to the restaurants up there and then the museums and, and Central Park. So working in Manhattan with so many varied communities, the East Side, the West Side, you know, Greenwich Village, Midtown Manhattan, you know, Spanish Harlem, I worked there. So um, uh, th that was a great, I mean, I know New York City, very few people know New York City. I, so so that was, that was a, privilege to work in midtown and and uptown and downtown you know so i i got to know and experience manhattan and even today i go back to manhattan and i spend weekends you know i used to bring my wife i uh, i bring my lady friend now we go back spend a weekend in manhattan i love the, the east side we stay at the mark hotel and you and the, one of your one of your questions is your favorite restaurant caravaggio's it's on 73rd and 74th Street between Madison and 5th. So that's my favorite restaurant. And Manhattan was my favorite boy, uh, favorite uh, borough. 
So what's the next question? Well, you answered the fourth one, and you obviously you answered the first one, so I can ask the second and the third, and then we'll get to the fifth. Second favorite boss you ever had? You know, it's funny. I never, you know, I, I never really I had a boss that I liked. That, no, I shouldn't say that. That I didn't think I could do a better job than. You know, I was a, a cocky guy, I guess. But I did, I finally, when I became a battalion chief in the 25th Battalion, Spanish Harlem, I got a boss named John Stankerone. He was the chief of the fourth, the commander of the fourth division. He was the first boss that I really admired. I admired the way he, he, he worked, he balanced it. It was a very tough time. We had a very conservative city was bankrupt, angry uh, headquarters. And, and, you know, we were trying to, figure out how to work, you know, after the layoffs, after the job action, there was bad morale in the job. But this guy, John Stankerone, you know, sort of kept us all together. And I really admired him. And I remember one time, you know, I'm submitting this report on how firefighters should get some after uh, fire R&R. You know, when they're dirty and 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 uh, giving some an hour or two hour or not, so I, I sent that to headquarters. And John says, "Take her on." Calls me up. He says, "Vin, they're not looking for that report. They they not they don't want that kind. They wanted to crack down." It was the time of the layoffs. We had a very difficult, tough chief uh, and fire commissioner. So it was the layoffs. There was the job actions. It was the it was uh, strike, so headquarters was angry with the field. So I remember John. He saved my butt. He said, "Finn, they don't want that. They don't want that kind of report." So I liked him. I he was the first boss that I remember admiring. So uh, so that was it. He was the division commander in the fourth uh, division. I liked him. So what was the next question? My third oh. favorite thing about being a boss. Okay, so I thought about that. Uh, first of all, having a say in things, you know, everybody wants to have a say in things. Well, if you're the boss, you have a say in things. You, you, you call the shots. It's a wonderful thing. Uh, helping firefighters get promoted. I liked the fact that I got that firefighter in 33 engine with the tattoos and a few other guys promoted. I felt very great. You know, I felt satisfied and I helped them get promoted. And of course he became my boss. And uh, uh, seeing and working in the city, I mean, like I, uh, uh, those areas, they were really beautiful. And it makes you a man. Uh, being a boss, you know, makes you a man, especially the captain's rank. You know, the captain's rank is the toughest rank. And you make more decisions in, as a captain than you do in any chief's rank. Uh, lieutenants are first line supervisor, that's where the rubber meets the road. They run, the, they're, they're important in the fire service, but captains are the real bosses. They're the middle of the hourglass. Oh, everything runs through the, that center portion. So that, that was it. Uh, uh, but let me tell you another thing. <clears throat> uh, becoming a boss, a friend of mine sends me this quote uh, about being a fire officer. And it was about me, actually, I think it was about being a teacher, but I converted it to about being a fire officer or a chief. It was by a guy named Hiram, Hiram Gunnott. And I'm paraphrasing this, but this is what it is like being a boss in the fire service or anywhere, but mainly in a fire service where you make life and death decisions. And this guy, Hiram Gunnott, he, say, he says, I have come to the frightening conclusion that as a fire officer, I am the decisive element in the firehouse. I can escalate or de-escalate a situation. I can humanize or de-dehumanize a firefighter. Now that is a stunning quote, but anybody that's a supervisor has to come to that. He says, I have come to the frightening conclusion that as a fire officer, I am the decisive element in the firehouse. 
I can escalate or de-escalate a situation. I can humanize or dehumanize a firefighter. And I liked humanizing firefighters and getting them promoted. So that was why I liked being a boss. And what's what it was like being a boss. And the fifth and final question, which you answered the uh, fourth one earlier about the restaurant is knowing what you know now, if you can go back in time and give advice to a younger version of yourself, what will you tell a young Vinnie Dunn? Well, first of all, I mean, you know what? I would have been a better fire officer. I am so impressed with the fire service that I said, I should have been better. I mean, I, I was pretty good, but I should have been better. I am, I am humbled by the opportunity I've been in the fire service. But, I, but the other thing I always tell a number, a young firefighter is, hey, think about what you do. We don't think about what we do. We go to these fires, we make these rescues, we help people. And we don't. We go back to the firehouse, have a cup of coffee, and t- play, you know, basketball, and don't think about what happened. You gotta think about what you do. And if you can, after I, I had 20 years in the job, and I never thought about what I did. You know, I, I would. Come home, try to forget what I saw or did. Do my uh, cut the grass, paint the house, take the kids out to, and take my wife out shopping, and uh, take the kids to school. But then I had 20 years in. I get assigned to the Bronx. And I'm saying, wait a minute, there's something going on here. This was 1977. The city was bankrupt. The city was burning. We didn't have any answers. We didn't know what was going to happen. We thought the city was going to end. And then I saw. And then I started thinking about what is going on. And then when I go back to fires and look at the buildings that were burned and what happened when the fires spread. And then I started writing about the fires and, and uh, lecturing about the fires and tr- writing books about the fires. So it starts with first thinking about what you do. We don't think in, in the fire service, we don't think about what we do. Some guys do, and when you do, and you got it. You say, I got to say something. I got to do something. Tell people what's going on in the fire service. Not, you know, it's, it's a wonderful career. And you want to, you want to, uh, and, uh, you know, tell the public how good we are. And it is an amazing journey. It's like a magic, I called it a magic copper. Working in the fire service was a magic copper, right? I went to those five boroughs, mostly around Manhattan. Did some wonderful things, and you know they brought out the best. It brought out the best in me, you know. And uh, so I, I believe in the situational theory of leadership. Your situation makes you the leader, and the fire service definitely makes you gives you the situation where you become a leader. This was an instant classic of an episode, Chief. I cannot thank you enough. Stick around. We'll say goodbye off the air. This was a phenomenal way for me to do my last show of the year 2022. And it was it was worth the wait to get you. Thank you, Mike. Oh, thank you. Stick around. Like I said, we'll say goodbye off the air. Uh, thanks, everybody. For I mean, I, when I say everybody, I mean not only all the guests, some of which are, some of you are at least who have been on the show previously are in the chat, but also just for your support throughout the year. It's been a big year for this show. We've done a lot. We've gained a lot. We've accomplished a lot. And you guys have seen me throughout this uh, amazing growth process. Uh, So I just want to thank you guys for being willing to support the show because anybody can start up a podcast. Anybody can start up a newsletter or whatever, but you need the audience. You need the audience. And without the audience, you're nothing. And I can honestly tell you, you guys have really made me. It's not me and my skill set. I'm always appreciative of the compliments that you guys give me. But reality is you guys, by consistently being here, supporting the show, even if you can't watch it live, you watch the replays, you listen to it on the audio side. Uh, you guys have made this show. So this is the last show of 2022 and it'll be the last show for a little while. I'm going to be on an extended hiatus. Uh, as you guys may have, if you follow me on Facebook and LinkedIn, I probably alluded to it. You saw it. Or I definitely alluded to it. You saw it. Uh, just have some big things going on. I'm preparing for a few different uh, life steps right now. You guys know I'm in the job hunt. Uh, and I think it's important I focus on that. There's many other big changes that I'll elaborate on as we go in 2023 that are occurring in my life. And so I just want to give that uh, my undivided attention, but I'm not going to be gone for long. I plan to definitely be back soon. And I'll say this, I'll see you in the summer. So you'll hear from me soon. Uh, just won't be right away, but we're going to be seeing each other again very, very soon. So thanks for your support. 
I'll be on hiatus, but I'll be around. I won't be dormant. I won't be silent. And on behalf of uh, Chief Retired FNY Deputy Chief Vincent Dunn, I am Mike Colon. This has been Volume 35 of The Best of the Bravest, and we will see you next time. Good night, everybody. Stay safe. Thank you.